Welcome back to Curbside Consults. Hello, my name is Leslie Chang, and I'm one of the New England Journal of Medicine editorial fellows for the 2021-2022 academic year. Today, we are taking a break from the guideline series to discuss climate change and health with a specific focus on education. Joining us today are a group of residents and students from across the country who are leading initiatives in this space. Hopefully, hearing their stories will inspire and guide others in doing the same at their respective institutions. Let's start off with a few introductions. I'll let each of you introduce yourselves to our listeners, maybe with your level of training and where you're at. Thank you so much, Leslie, for hosting us. My name is Jake Fox. I'm a second year internal medicine resident at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, and I'll kick it over to Carly. Thanks, Leslie. Excited to be here today. My name is Carly Hampshire, and I am a fourth year medical student at the University of California, San Francisco. Thanks so much, Leslie. Really excited to be here. My name is Thomas Kuzmarski. I'm a third year uh, intro medicine resident at Brigham Women's Hospital. Nice to meet each of you guys, and thanks for introductions. I'm really excited for this conversation we're about to have. Since we have listeners from all different levels of training, and since climate change and health are kind of just entering that scope of medical education or in that space, Could you give the audience a quick primer of the topic? And maybe we'll start with Jake. Sure can, Leslie. Um, I think I'll start with maybe how I got interested in this topic in the first place. I grew up in Colorado and throughout my childhood, I experienced drought. I smelled smoke, I even saw some of the foothills above my hometown on fire during a particularly dry wildfire season. But it wasn't really until I was in medical school that I grasped that these had major health implications for our communities and for our patients. And this all culminated when I saw a lecture during my first year of med school on uh, chronic kidney disease of unknown origin given by one of our nephrologists at uh, the University of Colorado. And it dawned on me that as temperatures rise around the world, there are going to be numerous and cross-cutting health effects for populations around the world. And everyone's going to experience this differently. And that sort of launched my interest into this particular topic. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about how we've pursued that both in medical school training and in residency training, but perhaps I'll uh, hand it off to one of my colleagues to talk about how they became interested in this topic as well. Thanks for sharing, Jake. Maybe we'll move over to Carly. Absolutely. That's a really compelling story, Jake. And to share a little bit more about how I got involved in this space, I started medical school at UCSF in 2018. And that September, the campfire was raging through Paradise, California. Um, There were pictures all over the news that maybe many of you have seen of the hazy, smoke-filled dystopian sky at that time. And ironically, we were in our pulmonary block in medical school at that time and walking to school every day in 95 masks to get to class. But even though there was this really obvious connection between climate change that was fueling these awful wildfires and what we were learning in the classroom, our lectures didn't make the connection. And it felt like a real missed opportunity that I wanted to address going forward in my, with my work in this space. And I'll pass it over to Thomas to share a little bit more about his story. Yeah, so I first became interested in this topic probably in December of 2019. I was a relatively new intern at the Brigham at the time and attended a grand rounds um, actually by Howard Frumkin and Bill McKibben, who are sort of two of the world leaders of this topic. And that talk really piqued my interest into the sort of intersection of climate change and health. I think prior to that talk, I had of course known that climate change causes rising uh, sea levels, cause flooding, can cause an impact on human health in the setting of natural disasters. But really it was the sort of use the same word that Jake used earlier is really the cross-cutting nature of climate change and its effect on health that made me realize how important it was and how sort of there was a pretty big gap both in medical school education and residency education. So after attending that talk, I began uh, collaborating with a couple of Brigham physicians and a couple of years later, yeah, we were able to incorporate more content into the residency education. So that was sort of the the jumping off point. Thanks all for sharing. It's really cool to hear how each of you came to the topic, whether it's personal experiences or academic lectures. I like the description of dystopian sky from you, Carly. I think that paints a great picture for how climate change has affected health. Each of you has kind of hinted at the different initiatives and using this kind of as a jumping off point for 
different things that you've been doing at your institutions. Maybe I'll go to Jake first, and then we'll hear from Carly and Thomas about how this interest has led to different things that you're doing at your institutions. Sure thing. Thanks, Leslie. I'll first say that there are several different sort of paradigms or precedents for climate and health education in medical education. So when I was a medical student at the University of Colorado, my exposure to this was through one-off lectures, perhaps hosted by some of our like emergency medicine groups or wilderness medicine groups. And then we also had a two-week sort of immersive climate and health elective for medical students who were specifically interested in this topic. When I came to MGH and I was interested in learning more and exploring this topic more as a clinician, I realized that a lot of the content was delivered differently. So in residency, as we all know, we get a lot of our teaching through noon conference lectures. And that's how I initially was exposed to this content where we'd have maybe a lecture on physician advocacy on climate and health or on the effects of heat on public health and uh, heat related illness. But there wasn't really a way to incorporate this into in like a longitudinal fashion so that we would be exposed to it over the course of residency and really appreciate how it interfaces or it implicates all uh, subspecialties in medical practice. And for that reason, I began to have conversations with my chiefs and some of our residency leadership about how we could expand education on climate and health in our residency. And I think we'll talk a little bit more in a few minutes, I think, about the challenges to doing that. But what we ultimately decided was it would be best to incorporate climate and health content into pre-existing lectures in our ambulatory didactic series. And to do so, I actually partnered with Thomas, and I'll have him comment on the Brigham experience more, to sort of build out these materials and begin to integrate them with our pre-existing lecture series at the uh, residency level. Thanks for sharing, Jake. Maybe we'll jump over to Thomas, since it sounds like Thomas, you're working with Jake a little bit to brainstorm ways to integrate this into the residency education. And then we'll go over to Carly to talk a little bit about medical student education. Yeah, definitely. So Jake alluded to a couple different ways to incorporate this into the residency education. I think we came up with two primary ways. One are the sort of freestanding lectures, such as a noon conference. And we were really excited to have three of these this past year. So one was sort of an hour-long introduction to climate change and health. I'm talking about the fundamentals of health impacts of climate change. And number two was the talk sort of on sort of climate smart healthcare, sort of how we as physicians can practice um, more sustainably. And then a third talk on physician advocacy within the sphere of climate change. So those were more freestanding, standalone lectures. But I think where we really are working towards trying to incorporate more longitudinal content is within our outpatient or within our ambulatory curriculum. And that's where what Jake alluded to as sort of pre-existing lectures, we tried to incorporate climate-related content into foundational lectures. So for example, we have one lecture in, at the Brigham for primary care. It's basically called CKD for the primary care physician. And in that lecture, we incorporated some discussion about CKDU or CKD for an unknown cause, which is a growing consequence of climate change. Another example is just sort of a basic asthma lecture and discussing the pertinent components to climate change and how climate change can increase asthma exacerbations and how we as physicians can sort of provide anticipatory guidance to our patients who are at higher risk for asthma exacerbations. So I think at the Brigham so far, it's been sort of this combination of freestanding lectures and then incorporating climate-related content into these more longitudinal ambulatory lectures. And I'll add that at the Mass General Hospital uh, Internal Medicine Residency Program, we've been doing similar things, um, including lectures like, for example, the implications of the climate crisis on the geriatric 5Ms. So how can we counsel some of our older patients on how to live meaningful, fruitful lives as the climate changes? One more thing I wanted to add, in addition to the things Thomas has said, we had these lectures in our ambulatory curriculum. We had these joint noon conference lectures between the Brigham and the MGH. We also had a sort of Harvard Medical Grand Round series. Thomas alluded to one a few years ago with Dr. Howie Frumkin and Bill McKibben. We also had one this year in which we heard from several leading voices in climate and health, including uh, Drs. Mary Rice, Karen Solomon, and Renee Salas with a keynote speech from Secretary John Kerry. 
And so I think this demonstrates that we're coordinating and collaborating across institutions to really build this in. And one thing we'll talk about in a minute is how we've realized there are a lot of other movements at other institutions across the country. And we've, in the past several months, been working to consolidate our efforts and work together to make resources available to other medical schools and residency programs who want to integrate such content into their curricula. That's very cool to hear how you guys are working across town and collaborating. It sounds mostly like noon conferences, grand rounds, and then trying to integrate more longitudinally through the ambulatory care lectures. I'm curious for others who are interested in starting similar initiatives at their residency programs, how Jake, you and Thomas found each other to collaborate. Do you have any suggestions for finding people with similar interests in introducing climate change and health into the residency programs? One thing I'll say, Leslie, I think there are many ways to connect with folks who are active in this space. I think Thomas and I are fortunate that we live in a city where there are a lot of leading voices in climate and health. And so I think for us, there's a large network of providers and mentors that we've been able to seek out. For folks who may not have that available to them at their home institution, there are a lot of organizations you can get involved with that can connect you with people who are very active in the climate and health space. A few that come to mind include the Healthcare Without Harm Network. Uh, you can look that up online and join as a resident member. There's the Physicians in Training for a Sustainable Future group, which is connected with the Healthcare Without Harm Network. And then for folks who really want to take a deep dive, there are some climate and health fellowships you can apply for after residency if you want to become a leader in this space yourself. So those are just a few things that come to mind right now. Thomas and Carly may have some other thoughts in addition to those. I'll just say that this is such a relatively new field that I think everyone's really excited to collaborate. So if someone's out there interested in working on a similar project, feel free to reach out to us. And I think we're all really excited to collaborate and help each other out. I can add a couple of groups at the medical student level. So Medical Students for Sustainable Future cropped up a few years ago, as Jake and Thomas have said. A lot of the organizations in this space are very new. We're all learning together, building this movement together. And I think the organization's newness is a good example of that. And then uh, an organization that I founded in co-direct, the Planetary Health Report Card Initiative, um, is also a network that's a little bit more international for medical students all over the world trying to take action on climate and curriculum reform. And then also at the community level, even if perhaps there isn't a strong cohort of students or residents at your school, as Jake mentioned, getting involved with the surrounding community, there might be community physicians who really want to take action on climate. And I've been connected with Physicians for Social Responsibility here in San Francisco, and it's been a lovely community to be part of. Thanks for suggesting all those awesome resources. Can we come to you, Carly, and to discuss a little bit about how your interest in this topic has led to different initiatives within the medical school at UCSF? Absolutely. So like Jake and Thomas mentioned, there are two approaches to curriculum reform, having a standalone lecture and then having a more integrative longitudinal curriculum. And when I first came to UCSF, there was a single standalone lecture on climate change and health in a type of category that we call frontiers in medicine. Um, and this was led by Thomas Newman. It was a great lecture, actually won an award for the best lecture at UCSF a couple of years ago. But we wanted to create something that was more longitudinal given the cross-cutting nature of climate and health topics. And so over the past couple of years, I've been working with a team of faculty and medical students to work with the different organ system blocks and integrate climate within the existing lectures. Um, and we've been successful thus far in incorporating in a few organ system blocks, for example, the pulmonary block, which was very full circle for me to have been the absence of climate in the pulmonary block be what initially led me to the space. And then now that has been addressed, um, but we're still working to do it even more than um, already exists. And then on a more broad scale, I'm also the founder and co-director, I mentioned, um, of an initiative called the Planetary Health Report Card Initiative. And this is a student-led metric-based initiative to evaluate and inspire planetary health and health professional schools. You can check out our website at phreportcard.org. But essentially what it is, is that student-led faculty mentored teams evaluate schools on metrics spanning five different categories, curriculum, research, community outreach and advocacy, support for student-led initiatives, and campus sustainability. And then they use the results to drive change. And at this point, over 80 medical schools in seven countries have conducted needs assessments of their schools. And we found that having the results in hand with a summary of like, here are very discrete actions that you can take 
can be a really powerful tool for catalyzing not just curriculum form, but reforms in all of those categories. And as an example, here at UCSF, the report card results were leveraged in the grant application to obtain the funding for the ongoing curriculum transformation efforts. So if you're not sure where to begin, doing a needs assessment is a good place to start. That's really cool to hear, Carly, about both what you're doing more nationally and internationally and also at home at UCSF. I'm wondering, um, Jake mentioned and touched on a collaboration between UCSF and Boston area. Can you elaborate on that, Carly? And then Jake can jump in with any additional thoughts as well. Absolutely. We noticed that a lot of the curriculum reform efforts were siloed within individual institutions. And this is such a new and evolving space that there aren't so many experts at this point. And so we wanted to found an initiative where the expertise of individual people at different institutions wouldn't be limited to just those institutions. Like how can we crowdsource resources so that anyone anywhere can access them and implement them in their curriculum, even if they perhaps don't have the time, resources, expertise to develop them themselves. And so this collaboration is spearheaded by the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education, which is based at Columbia. But there are also faculty and student representatives from um, Brigham and Women's, from Mass General, from UCSF, and then from Emory University. And so we put together templates and individual students, residents, faculty can sign up to take on a topic within climate and health, um, put together either a problem-based learning case or slides that cover that topic, and then submit them to our team, which reviews them. And eventually we're launching a website where all of this will be publicly available. And I feel like that was just the bare minimum skirting over some of the core details. So I'll turn it over to Jake and Thomas to add anything I missed. I think that was an awesome overview, Carly. I'll just give a little more backstory on how this evolved because I think it's illustrative of how these collaborations form, particularly in this new and evolving space, as Carly alluded to. So a few minutes ago, I talked about how Thomas and I had been collaborating across the city of Boston to work on some of these residency education efforts. Carly is doing pioneering work with Medical Students for a Sustainable Future, or MS4SF, and her planetary health report card. I reconnected with one of the former University of Colorado Climate Fellows that I had the opportunity to work with while I was a medical student, Dr. Cecilia Sorensen, who is at the Global Consortium for Climate and Health Education in Columbia. And we sort of had the idea with Natasha Sood, who is one of the student fellows there this year and who is unfortunately unable to join us today, that we could really collaborate and build out resources for both medical student education and resident education if we all work together. And from there blossomed this big collaboration across institutions across the country and now even across parts of the world where we've invited medical students, residents, and faculty advisors and mentors to get involved and help us build all this content together with the ultimate goal of creating a sort of public good, a public repository of climate health education materials that can be used by medical educators in whatever way suits their local context. Thomas, do you want to add a few details on that? Yeah, maybe just a few thoughts. It was a fantastic overview. I think the really exciting um, aspect of this project is not only the final product, which will hopefully be this publicly used resource that medical schools can use and residencies can use, but we've discovered that just through the process of making these curricular materials and putting these teams together, that it has been such a great effort in terms of like raising awareness of climate change and health. Um, you have orthopedic residents collaborating with one another across the country. You have medical students interested in infectious diseases that are collaborating with physicians abroad and in, in India and Canada. So I think it really has spoken to the collaborative nature of this topic. And I think hopefully it's just only going to continue to snowball. There's another branch of it, which Carly has been leading the charge on, and I'll let her discuss additional details, but there's a sort of interprofessional education branch where we're trying to incorporate nurses and pharmacy students and pharmacists and PT and OT and and really get the whole spectrum of healthcare professionals involved. So I think the project is really exciting and we're really uh, hopeful that it continues to grow in the next few months. Yeah, to speak a little bit to that, Thomas, of course, it's not just physicians and medical students and residents leading the charge with climate and health. 
it's everybody. I think climate change is a great example of where professional collaboration is very necessary. And so to that end, we're developing a branch of the Climate Resources for Health Education project that is focused on interprofessional education. So there'll be cases that in professional education programs and institutions can use to have different teams walk through whatever an individual patient might need for their care. And then also we're thinking about simulations. So some residency programs might do a simulation for a climate-related disaster in the emergency department where all hands are needed on deck and how can we bring climate change into one of those simulations. So this part is just getting started, but we're really looking forward to the potential this has and also the possibility to engage all the different professions in this project. And one other thing I wanted to add is all these things that are being designed are rigorously reviewed by subject matter experts and by by teams of folks who are familiar with this content. And so I think there's a good amount of fidelity in the things that are being created. I'm just really excited, as we all are, to see where this goes. Carly, could you guys give us a sense of what's included in the breadth of the curriculum that you guys are creating? So I think there's two components of this curriculum. One we've talked about a bit, which is the health effects of climate change themselves, how in every organ system you can imagine, climate change will have consequences. But then the other component that I think is really important, especially when thinking about how students and trainees can implement this education practically, is the environmental harms of healthcare delivery itself and how in their future practice, clinicians can work to mitigate those. So it's important to point out that healthcare, particularly U.S. healthcare, is responsible for a huge portion of greenhouse gas emissions, 8.5% here in the U.S. And unlike other sectors, we have a moral imperative to do no harm to protect health, which is directly at odds with the outsized environmental impact we're causing. So some examples of ways that trainees can learn to be part of the solution and not the problem are education on various greenhouse gas effects of different anesthetic gases. So does fluorine really potent greenhouse gas? And it makes sense for people to use something like sevofluorine instead, or the environmental harms of overprescribing in the pharmaceutical industry. And you know, when a patient leaves the hospital, can you mark their hospital medications for outpatient use, which is also has a lot of cost benefits for that patient. So these are just a couple examples. And I guess I would underscore what Carly said, this is the effects of climate and health are far reaching, no matter how folks decide to tailor their medical careers. If you have a purely clinical career, you're going to see this in your emergency department, in your operating room, in your ICU. If you do research, climate change can implicate your work at the bench. If you're doing environmental epidemiology, it's certainly um, an exposure that needs to be studied more. And if you're interested in just healthcare operations or quality improvement, A lot of these healthcare sustainability projects are fantastic endeavors to include in QI efforts at your local institution. So I I think there is something for everybody here. It's really cool to hear about these cases that you're developing. I think it sounds like it's a really great learning tool for all levels of learners. Thomas, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about if there are individuals who want to get involved in this project, how they can get involved and when we might be expecting these tools to come out. So... We would definitely encourage anyone interested in getting involved to visit the GCCHE website, so the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education website. And within that website, you can see a link to our Climate Resources Health Education Endeavor. We're in the midst of working on a website, which will hopefully be done this summer. And that website will house all of these undergraduate medical education problem-based learning cases, as well as the residency slide decks. So stay tuned for that resource. Really, really exciting stuff. If you guys feel comfortable, would love the links to some of the things that you guys have mentioned, some of the resources, the report card that you've helped develop, Carly, and when this becomes public, would love to share it. I feel like you guys have so many initiatives going on that you make it sound so easy make it sound like everything kind of came together really quickly, but I'm sure that there were so many barriers and challenges that you had to overcome and navigate. So I'd like to spend the next few minutes just talking about, in both in medical school and in residency, some of the barriers and challenges that you had to overcome to get these things moving. Let's start with Carly to discuss some of the challenges in the medical school space. 
I think a lot of the barriers are related to lack of resources at individual institutions, whether that's lack of faculty expertise, lack of funding, lack of curricular space, especially the last one, lack of curricular space. And then from the student side, there's also this sense of, I already have to learn so much to become a health professional. There's already this fire hose of information coming at me. How can I add this to when it's not even tested on my licensing exams? So some of the best practices that we found for addressing these barriers are one, as we've talked about, integrating climate and health into existing curricula. So where you're already learning about vector-borne diseases, can you throw in a slide or two about the changing geographic distribution of those vectors due to climate change? Or where you're already talking about structural determinants of health, can you use redlining and heat as an example? So this curricula doesn't require brand new standalone lectures. And I think it's important to emphasize that when you're meeting with the curricular leaders. And in fact, I think it's actually more effective if it's integrated because it's not as existentially overwhelming for students. And it's also better reflective of the broad pervasive health consequences of climate change. And I think faculty and student co-production of knowledge is also helpful. So when faculty and students are working together, students can bring energy, valuable student perspective, and then faculty can bring clinical knowledge and longevity, ensuring that resulting curricular transformation isn't just happening that one year that the student happens to be in the thick of it, but that it's sustainable and lasts for many, many years. I love that. I feel like space and attention are two things that are always lacking in medical school education. And I love that co-production idea as well. What about from the residency perspective? And we can start with Jake and then move to Thomas. So well said, Carly. And I think a lot of the challenges at the undergraduate medical education level are mirrored in the graduate medical education space. I think the core issue that I encountered at my institution was not a lack of interest in this topic. I think everyone I spoke to in our administration um, was very interested and wanted to incorporate this. It's really just space constraints. So when I approached my leadership as an intern asking for more of this content in our curriculum, I got some pushback saying like, are we going to have to displace core clinical teaching in order to have lectures on climate and health? Well, I remember my chief specifically said, should we forgo a lecture on, say, acute myeloid leukemia to talk about air pollution? And those are really, I think, tough and perhaps not productive conversations to have. So we sort of changed the paradigm for how we teach this. And as Carly alluded, we found that it was better for a number of reasons to try to incorporate this in a longitudinal fashion into pre-existing lectures in our ambulatory curriculum, where residents have to go to lectures in all medical subspecialties across the three years of residency. The reason this was a good space to do so is there were a diverse array of fellows and attendings delivering these lectures. We could, a few slides be incorporated into these slide decks that were already being delivered. The lectures were compulsory for residents. And as Carly mentioned, there's a lot of value in co-production. So as we asked faculty members and fellows to incorporate this content, we were both bringing them into our efforts and also teaching them some things about a sort of bigger health problem that implicates their specialty, but they may not have appreciated before. Anything to add, Thomas? Yeah, I think the only thing I'll add, I totally agree with what Carly and Jake said. I would say from my personal experience, time and expertise were far and away the biggest challenges. Time, both from a resident standpoint and from a faculty standpoint. Many faculty were very interested in this topic, but brushing up with the most up-to-date research and literature takes time. And if they need to present on it, they're going to have to do that. So that's really where we sort of adopted the what we like to call the train the trainer approach, which is basically going out asking faculty, would you mind incorporating these extra few slides on this topic into your slide deck? And as Jake just alluded to, it not only educates the faculty member, but also takes a lot of work off their plate. So it's sort of a win-win, and we found that to be pretty effective. If I can add one more thing, I just wanted to highlight something that's actually not a barrier. I think there's a perception sometimes among faculty, even in California, that there will be political resistance to having this content in the curriculum. And I think when talking to students, that's just not the case. This is, as Jake said, students are very, very open to having this content and everyone's worried about climate change. Everyone sees the health consequences of climate change um, and they want to see this content in the curriculum. And I think a stat that reflects that is we did a research survey among medical students at different U.S. medical schools, asking them what they thought about 
climate change in the medical school curricula, and 84% of students believe that the health effects of climate change should be included in the core medical school curriculum. So this is not a controversial topic. I will emphasize what Carly just said. They're not only like major cross-cutting health implications from the climate crisis. I think a lot of us are just personally feeling this day to day. And I think there's a lot of resident and trainee interest in learning more about this topic. Boston, we just had a summer heat wave in May. Last year, we had smoke from wildfires up in Canada, just sort of running through the streets of Cambridge. So this is something that we can't ignore at all. And I think people are interested in learning more about it, how it's going to implicate their future practice and what they can do about it. Thanks for bringing that up, Carly and Jake. I think that's something that um, listeners should really, there definitely is interest amongst learners and teachers alike. Thanks for sharing all the great things that you guys have been doing. On the way out, do you guys have any final words of advice or wisdom for individuals who might be wanting to start initiatives at their own institutions? I would say one uh, piece of advice is try to avoid working in a silo. There are so many passionate groups of people working on this topic throughout the country and reaching out to them, collaborating with them can be such a huge help. So if you're thinking about working in this field or are already working on it, definitely don't feel like you're doing this alone and feel free to reach out to others through some of the resources that we'll provide online and feel free to collaborate with one another. That's great. And we'll include any resources you guys send in the notes section of the podcast. Anything from you, Carly? Yeah, I would say it's important to keep in mind that education is not the end, it's the beginning. The end goal here is for clinicians to be prepared to diagnose, manage, and prevent health consequences of climate change. And so to the extent that the education you integrate in either medical school education or residency education can be really practical, that will be even more powerful. Awesome. And Jake? I'd underscore what Thomas and Carly just said. Please don't do this in a silo. And uh, there's a lot of resources out there in addition to the ones we just discussed. One thing I'll point you all to, since this is a New England Journal podcast, is there was an interactive module published recently on the New England Journal website called The Climate Crisis, Health and Care Delivery. I think that's also a great resource that people can access. And again, just want to say this problem, both in the education space and in society writ large, requires collaboration um, across groups and different populations. And so our efforts in the curricular space as we aspire to incorporate more climate health education needs to mirror our aspirations as a society to tackle this great problem. Thanks so much, Carly, Thomas, and Jake. I feel really lucky to have had the chance to talk with you guys and hear all the amazing things you guys are doing. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Leslie. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Leslie. Thank you. This was a great discussion. That wraps up this episode of Curbside Consults. Our production team at NEJM Resident 360 includes Karen Buckley, Lynn Winston Perry, Kyle Simmons, Mike Thomasis, Tim Vining, Scott Williams, and Kathy Stern. Also, a special thanks to our NEJM education editor, Dr. O.P. Hamvik. Curbside Consults is brought to you by NEJM Resident 360, a product of NEJM Group.